Thank, Thank my brother. you, Pastor. I promised Sally I would talk with a southern drawl tonight. What I've done is um, to the BCMC Insight, posted all the three teachings we've done together. So it's like you get on the website, now there's a section called MVC Teachings. And you know why I did that? Because I'm hoping you will be on that site fairly frequently to learn and to, for us to share together. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I really want to thank Pastor and all of you for coming. It's so hard in the middle of the week. I know sometimes I can't be here because I travel a lot, and so it means a lot. And um, have any of you ever heard of the term emotional intelligence? It's really kind of an interesting term. There was a whole book written about it where, and I'm going to tell you what it means to me rather than the book, but this is a lesson less on scriptural intelligence and more of emotional intelligence. And let me explain that. Pastor has a heart of now opening up our doors to Hebraic roots and to do the feasts, and we have a core group in here. It's been really interesting to see. Just since I've been here, we're close to 12, 13, maybe 15, maybe growing of families who have participated either in a Messianic congregation, come from a Jewish background, and if we think about 100 people, we're kind of like 10 to 15% of our group and more and more. And pastor has a background in these things, but to open up a door is very unusual. I mean, um, I won't mention any specific name, but we have been at some very large churches and people, the main question they always ask me, find out with Jewish is, why don't the Jewish people get it? I think that question will be answered a lot tonight. I think it's going to, as we try to connect to them and we see how difficult it is for us to get it with the Holy Spirit in us, it becomes a little easier to understand how people who have been through what we're going to talk about today have been through. So I just thought this scripture, Luke 24, was very interesting because really our focus is on Jesus, and that's what Pastor's been sharing with us. And I wish Greta were here so I could publicly tell her, you know, I, I've communicated her twice or three times on it. I loved her teaching. I just thought it was really cool how she used illustrations to say, you know, if we focus on Jesus, the experience comes behind us. Because when I first came to faith, I came as a Jewish person. I didn't come because I knew about Messiah and the thousand or so scripture prophecies that he fulfilled. And think of the, you know, the billion to trillion to one of somebody fulfilling all those prophecies. I'd never heard of Messiah or even as a Jew growing up. I never heard of this holiday that, or remembrance that we're going to celebrate today. And you can go to the next slide that I never, you know, heard of Tishba. You may think it's unusual that I start with this when only two years ago did I lead my first Tishba remembrance service and teaching. But now I see it as one of the cornerstone teachings. When I first um, really got into Purim, I always thought of it as a children's holiday. You know, you bake little cookies that represent Haman, his hat called Humantashen, and when you read the book of Esther, you say, boo, and when you hear the word Haman, you go, yay, when you hear the word Mordecai, and most Jewish people think of it, but it's actually one of the deepest theological books connecting what happened to Israel to modern time events like the Holocaust and end time events like during the tribulation when all nations come against Israel. It's one of the first books where God's name isn't specifically mentioned, but just alluded to as him involved in all events. And so, and Hanukkah is also very interesting. It's mentioned in our Bible one time, 
when Jesus associates the miracles of Hanukkah with the fact that he was Messiah. And so, what I think you'll see more, when I, the reason I was saying emotional intelligence, is we're really going to have almost, you might say, a funeral service. And if you've been, you know, maybe you watch TV or you see somebody dies and they put candles and they put pictures up and people get up and they talk about the person and memories and maybe even talk about the future. In a way, that's what I mean we're going to have basically a funeral service for the tabernacle and the temple that were destroyed on what's called the ninth of Av, Tish B'Av. And in a minute, you'll see that this particular day is considered a day that many major tragedies happen to Israel. And so often when the church teaches about Israel, we look at them for, and we say, they just couldn't cut it. They, God gave them all the blessings of the law and they failed. And all the time you'll hear, the Jews didn't do this right here. Let me show you where we're supposed to be as Christians. And what I want us to understand is when God is talking about Israel and the Jewish people, he really is talking about all of us. How next time when we meet, when we talk about the people, we could ask ourselves a question, when are we like Isaac? When are we Father Abraham? When are we like Esau or Ishmael? When do we act like King David and when do we act like Saul? So we start relating or connecting. So what I'm trying to get to is emotional intelligence is for us to really embrace Hebraic roots here and for us to understand why it's so important for us to do the feast, we first have to emotionally connect ourselves to Israel and to the Jewish people. And so let me give you another thing. We can go to the next slide. Let me give you another example as you kind of ponder these tragedies. One of the tragedies was said that happened on 9th of Av, and I don't know if this is true, but this is the day it's commemorated when in the desert, God told all the people of Israel that that generation other than Caleb and Joshua would not go into Israel. I could guess that that was kind of a bummer for a lot of people. And I had to use mine things, but I just want us to kind of, you know, get down to it. I think sometimes we are disconnected from the Bible as far as what the stories mean and what it was like to be a human being in those situations. And therefore, when we talk about the Holocaust, we talk about something, we can't understand it. So, let me give you an example. And this is something I think everybody's had happen. You're driving down the highway... And it's a Saturday, and you're thinking, thank God it's not rush hour, you know, bumper to bumper to bumper. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're in bumper to bumper traffic. And you're going so slow, and you're going somewhere, and you left a little bit late. It could be really annoying. Is there anybody who doesn't think that could be really annoying? And you're there, and you're waiting, and you're waiting. But then as you kind of moved a little bit down the road, you see EMS vehicles, you hear sirens, you see fire hydrants, fire stations, you, then you see the big crash. In a sense, when you see that crash, and you know it's just not workers or whatever, there is something that happens in your heart momentarily where you go, wow, I hope everybody's all right. But when that traffic opens up, it's gone in our minds. It's gone. I mean, everybody knows it. It's gone. Then, let's say you get home, and you're watching TV, and you hear about the accident. So, you go, whoa, I was there. And then, you find out somebody you knew died in that accident. I think we could all experience, when it becomes personal to us, that tragedy might even cause us to cry and, and really affect us. It could be a family member or a friend of a family member. So, when we hear about tragedies of Israel, 
are we thinking of them as our people? As, oh, I know them. They're Jesus' people. They're Paul's people. They're my people. Or do we kind of think of them as the group that didn't make it? You see what I'm getting at? So that's why I think, and I talked to Pastor two months ago, I think we need to emotionally connect to Israel and the Jewish people before these feasts will really mean something to people. So if we look at these tragedies, we're going to see that some of them are really almost ordained by God. They were prophesied, they happened due to warnings, and Israel failed. And some of them are due to outright hatred of Jewish people by people who ran our church and people who ran the political powers of countries. So, let's just say we got We've all been fired from jobs, some like me more than others. I guess I've kind of don't even worry about it anymore. It's like, oh, great, new beginning. No. Um, but you could be devastated when you're fired, or you, maybe you've had a divorce in your life. That's, think about now a whole group of people because of their faith being thrown out of a country. So it's, you know, I think when we kind of relate, that's pretty intense to think of being occupied. And why didn't they see Jesus? He's all over the scriptures. Well, could we think about 400 years of occupation and desecration of their land and home? Would you not be waiting for somebody, a savior, to come and get you out of that situation. And again, I'm, as I said, I, I'm, if we don't get, there's a lot of slides here. I don't care if we get through all of them, if we make that emotional connection, because you could read the slides up on the website. But I always tell this, Paul, I always try to do modern day parables. Let's say terrorist groups occupy your house and family, and people are desecrated. I won't use words that too offensive, and they threaten you, and they're, and they're occupying you and humiliating you. Then the Red Cross negotiates their way in, and you're going, could you tell the FBI to attack this place and get me out of here? And they say to you, oh, I'm not here to try to help you get out of here. I want you to forgive your captors and pray for their goodwill. That's what Jesus in essence did. He went to a people who thought they loved God, who truly embraced that zeal for God, had been keeping the faith, and been persecuted by a group of people who were basically you know, everything we speak against in sin. That's what the Romans were. They, they did a lot for God in building roads and traffic, but they were the bad guys, not the Jewish people. Christ killers of the Jews. Well, the people who led the country at that time were handpicked by Rome because they were willing to do. They wouldn't have been there in authority. They wouldn't have been priests if God had picked them because they wouldn't have put up with what they did. So, do you see what I'm kind of getting at? These tragedies, I want us to get a little bit more involved with them and connect. So, let's go to the next slide and understand temple life. So, we're looking at two major temples, and I'm just kind of summarizing, but we're hopefully going to take a tour through the history of the temples, but very brief one. There, out of the 613 mitzvahs or commandments in what is called the Torah, the first five books, and you know, there is there exactly 613 Jewish people are great with numbers, and somehow it comes out to 613, has to do with the number of bones in your body and the days of the calendar year. If you add those two numbers up, it comes out to 613. So, if there was only 610, they would have found two more commandments. 
sense, right, Pastor? You know, you know what I'm saying. Somehow it works out to great numbers. But 120 of them are about the temple and sacrifices. That's a lot. So when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the final temple, all those laws went away, yet Jesus said pretty much they all stand. So when people tell me we have to take every law literally and we have to keep kosher and we have to do the things, I go, well, is that what he meant when we can't do 120 of them right off the bat? But the key is, is that temple was the center of life. In a minute, we're going to see a picture of it, and I think you're going to understand what I'm talking about. But if you look at Jesus' ministry, as most of you do all the time, when at eight days, he went to the temple after he was birthed. They went from Bethlehem to the temple so he could have circumcision. So when the Bible has all this discussion about circumcision, circumcision wasn't evil. It was a blessing we talked about the covenant of blood, the little blood that would go through the male lines to lead us to Christ. So he was circumcised, just like he said to John, baptize me in all, you know, holiness, you know, to do what's right. Even though he should have been baptizing John, John recognized that. So Jesus was circumcised. So how would we ever say that what Paul is saying is that circumcision is wrong? God almost killed Moses because Moses had not killed, I mean, circumcised his son before he went to let the people out. His wife, who was a, you might say a Gentile grafted in, did the circumcision. And how she understood what God was about to do, but she saw the shadow of God ready to kill Moses and his son, and she went in and circumcised him. So just kind of a little connection. Um, when Jesus was 12, he was hanging out at the temple. His family had left, <laughs> thinking he was with the big family caravan going back. And he was in the Lord's house. He said, didn't you know when the parent found him that I would be in my father's house? He considered the temple his father's house. Remember the couple times he went in and kicked off, you know, and twice, I believe, he cleared the temple of things that were going on there. And, um, well, we're so easy to condemn the Jewish people and say, ah, oh, they were using God's house for this and that. Well, when we get an understanding and see the picture of it, that was the gathering place. <laughs> I mean, that was the place to go. And over time, you know, people took advantage. There was 400 years about from the time of Malachi, the last prophet, to the time of Jesus. Do you know how long Jewish people were in slavery? About 430 years. See, as we kind of really get to know Hebrews, you can see these patterns. So, God was quiet until he sent Moses to get them out. And do you know what the Jewish people did in order to be slaves for 400 years? Nothing. God just says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. And by the way, your people are going to be enslaved for 400 years. I, I mean, he must have been a man of faith. I'd be kind of questioning things like that. And maybe he did, but it wasn't written in. But you see what I'm getting at? That temple was vital to Jesus' life. He was crucified right outside the temple. And there's all sorts of Hebraic meanings. We're going to look at some of that next week when we talk about the people. We're going to see that it really represented God's presence. That was the purpose of it. It was to bring a place, a house for the Lord. And when we go back to Genesis, I keep emphasizing this kingdom message of back to Genesis because we'll understand more when we get done, but it was the cool of the garden. We see that present. That is the most amazing scripture. To me, it's one of my favorite scriptures of anything. God planted a garden. <laughs> Do you see the Holy One and Creator of this universe going over to your house and helping you get your rose bushes looking better? I mean, He planted a garden. It is so personal to tell us that we are the crown jewel of that creation. And that's how we thought of the temple. 
it was the crown jewel. For God to allow the temple to be destroyed hurt him deeply. When there was a split in the kingdom, if you remember Rehoboam, Solomon's son, said, oh, I'm going to keep up these big building projects. You can't have peace. Jeroboam and the ten tribes of Israel said, well, we're separating from you. We're, gonna, we're not paying tribute to you. We're going to move on. But when we talk about the feast, we talk about the ingathering, that they were to come to Jerusalem three times a year for pilgrimages. Jeroboam was so scared that by coming to the temple, they would develop a heart for the king of Judah that he built all these high places in Baal worship, which is what leads to the destruction of them years later. And then eventually the Jewish people from Judea and Benjamin, when we see the first temple destroyed by Babylonian. <clears throat> so the temple had a very important meaning there because they was afraid by going to the temple there would be so much affection and love and meeting all the guys and gals, you know, the community. And then I think we could personalize that and say, you know, I think most of us have built our life now around this church or the church that you go to. Um, I know mo I have. I mean, if we're doing something Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, you know what I'm saying. We have a tendency, just as the Jewish people have their community around the synagogue, but the whole nation and the whole world held the temple up like that. Okay, so let's move on. See, I'm trying to go very slow because we're just building this connection, and then we'll pick up a little bit. Okay, so now we see this temple. This is a model, and underneath there actually is probably a thing of where I got the model, but I have that. But I was looking at it and going, wow, well, what was that in the background? Then I realized it was a model. I was going, oh, my God, I'm not looking at a picture. It's so good, it's such a good model. I was thinking, oh, that's a photograph of the temple. How'd they get that back there? But it's not. It's, look at the size of that to the rest of Jerusalem. Isn't that, you know, it's huge. But... One thing I want you to notice is these little tags, outside the temple, outer court, inner court, holy place, holy of holies. There was distinct levels of people who could approach God at this time. And when we think of the temple being destroyed, you could think of it as being destroyed because Israel sinned and God punished them. But you could also see it is that God wanted to take away the temple from being the center of their life because he wanted us now to be able to approach him through Jesus without any partitions. And I think you could get your mind, we just had a little incident and our backyard was pretty well wiped out by this storm and, you know, my house is there, but thank God, you know, because think about your, the, you know, your temple being destroyed. Okay, so let's get going. I think we could see the size of that. So when it's now in rubble, we look at Matthew 23 and see Jesus loved the Jewish people. He really did. He came to them first. He was part of them. He was his family. But look at this passage. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So yes, he prophesied and knew the temple would be destroyed. But in a sense, we have to see this as a promise that he was going to return once the heart of Israel came back to him. Do you know what the term blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is about? Anybody got a thinking cap thing going? And Jaime, are you familiar with that? I'm not trying to put pressure, but 
Tommy has a very good background in Hebraic roots, and he's going to join me in our service later. But it is what the bride says about the groom when they come for the wedding feast. So, the whole gospel is based on the Jewish wedding. The Holy Spirit sealing us, the giving of something, Jesus marrying the church, the church being the bride of Christ, he going away, building a house for us. Remember he said in the mansion. When after the time where the groom has left, they've been engaged, they're married, but they haven't consummated the marriage or had the wedding feast yet, there's usually a year's time, and then when the groom comes back, they say this to his coming back. So, one reason I'm trying to share Hebraic roots for you is there are so many things that Jesus say that have to do with Jew Jewish life and culture and the Old Testament that we're missing those kind of analogies because the whole gospel is based on the Jewish wedding, and hopefully we'll get to talk about that sometime. Okay, so let's move on. And I guess I had one thing more to say about that I, that is important. Many times we look at Jewish people and say, okay, they have community. Many of them have reasonable earnings and livings and family. And we think they don't need the gospel. God's going to take care of them in another way. But there's no indication of that in the Bible, that there's a different path for Jewish people to be saved. So a lot of times when you hear my heart to you all is I believe we've been a barrier as a church to Jewish people entering it and should we then say, well, we have to have it flagged for every nationality? No. That's, we want to go out to all the nations. But God said, first, kind of bless the Jewish people. They're their foundation because Jesus portrayed himself to us as a Jewish person. God is the one who is Hebraic, and they're desolate without God. <laughs> So they're even the worst. I cry for my older, my younger sister. My older sister's messed up enough where I might reach her someday. And I don't mind saying it. I, Michelle and I know it. I mean, she's my pathway, but she's afraid because of what my father and mother might do, you know, disowning her and her daughter. But my other sister just thinks she is okay. But, you know, you can have a disease and on the surface look great but be dying on the inside and that's what we have to if we're emotionally connecting there's very few groups as not okay as the Jewish people because they think they're okay <laughs> I don't know if that made any sense okay so let's go to the next one so again now we're gonna connect I think the best way to connect is 9-11. For years and years and years, Arab terrorism against the Jewish people prevented a solution. And it was always thought, well, that's the Arab Israel, we got to get the, the good oil out of that land. They're the ones responsible. They keep attacking the Arabs and everything like that. Then 9-11 hit. In a sense, Michelle and I sometimes cry when we see movies and we see these twin towers up. You ever see old movies and see? They were huge. They were the city. That's kind of how I would compare the temple, right? It was it. It was the glory. And those were taken down because the Arabs felt like it would portray Western corruption of money and everything. I watched them fall. I was fortunate. Any of you guys have, where you happen to be on TV, watching TV and, and see it? Of course, we've all seen reruns. But it was amazing. It was like, oh, my God, these two giant towers tumbled to the ground. So, in a sense, we have to ask ourselves, Katrina and Sandy and 
you know, we get to World War II and six million Jews died, but did you know 50 million people from the world died? 50 million. And so what I'm trying to connect us to is when we worship tonight and we get into this ninth of Am, it is about us. God wants us to focus on Israel because it is kind of the way we less focus on all tragedies. If we could somehow connect and understand what these feasts mean is we're connecting ourselves as all nations. They're, they're all individual, right? They all have their own things. But through the Hebrew nation and the kingdom, God could unite us without hostility in Messiah. And until that happens, we'll have continued hostility. And I'll show you that. Let's keep going. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this next line, but... When Paul talks in Romans, he doesn't say the wrath of God is being revealed to Jewish people from heaven. He's explaining that all humanity is without excuse, that it isn't really just about all the failures of the Jewish people. It could be any nation. Because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he loved the Jewish people. But let's face facts. I've been there. When I went to college, I got into drugs and all sorts of cruddy stuff that eventually, six, seven years later, led me to Christ because I wanted out of that. I came just like Jesus said. I wanted to get out of the world. I was called out. That's what he wants from all of us. And so I believe Satan has stolen the love and passion we're supposed to have for Israel and the Jewish people, and it is leading to all the idols of this world, because it's taken prayer out of school, it's taken the understanding of creation. The six-day Sabbath is about God created the heaven and earth, and God made the seventh day holy. It has nothing to do with worshiping on the, seventh, the eighth day and blessing the Lord's resurrection. It's about remembering what God did at creation to show that he, and not evolution created the world but we've taken that out by taking out our love and connection to Israel so let's go to the next line even Jesus connected himself to the temple to explain himself in John 2 18 what sign the Jewish people asked him you know the leaders do you give us he said destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up and then the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. And underneath this is another example why I'm trying to focus us on the kingdom to understand Israel, and not just Israel church in Colossians 1 for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son when we understand the temple we understand Jesus because the temple was destroyed because of sin and Jesus's body was destroyed and just as Jesus was resurrected we're going to see that God's going to resurrect the temple So let's keep going. The only thing on this slide I'm going to talk to you about is I find, you know, this is a sadness that I have that on the top part, it tries to tell Israel not to be prideful, that it's God's love for his patriarchs and their faith that allowed him to love them. And he tries to take away their pride of feeling superior to the Sumerian woman and the Romans. Jesus didn't allow sin to come in, but he showed love to the Romans, and I think you all know that. When they were willing to come to him by faith, he 
acknowledge them, even the Sumerian woman. He, took, he showed the proper place to love all people, and he was trying to show the Jewish people that. But in Romans, Paul spends a considerable amount of time trying to say the same thing to the church that would be primarily Gentile, even though Jew and Gentile come together. And let's kind of talk about this, just read this one. I speak the truth in Christ. So Paul is speaking, but he's resting in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms in the Holy Spirit. We have Paul, Christ, and the Holy Spirit testifying to what is to be said. I think he wants the church to grab it. Wouldn't you say so? You know, you've heard the thing, if three things happen, if God says it three times, I think we heard that in one of your teachings. I'm pretty sure we did. But this is an example of it. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off for Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Now, where do we jump from that to some of the things we're going to see of hate from the church to the Jewish people? I mean, it's not like this passage is hidden. There is a clear statement that follows this that says that it is Paul's desire that we as a church recognize he, his Jewishness and bless the Jewish people and bring them to envy so some of them could be saved. And he talks about the glory, the covenant, the law, the temple, and all the things of Hebraic roots that we're sharing. He makes a big deal. Those are big things that God gave us through them. And the patriarchs, that's why we're going over the patriarchs, and the human history of Christ. The humanity of Christ is essential to understand how he could be the Messiah. And he created a people to share himself. And there was no way they could live up to him. And I think you're beginning to see we have the Holy Spirit in us. We're still getting divorces. We're still having sin in our lives. So where do we kind of get off, you might say, to constantly say, well, the Jewish people didn't get it. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Are we as a church loving the Jewish people as Paul loved them? You can answer that in your heart. So let's take a look at something. Many people just do not understand that the church itself has been anti-Semitic and shown hate to the Jews. We always think, well, they're not really Jews. They're, oh, they're really not Christians if they think that way. Okay, well, who is a Christian then? You know, if people are standing and doing things in the name of Christ, in the beginning, of course, there was anti-Semitism that God talked about from the Amalekites. That's the story of Purim. They wanted to wipe out all the Jewish people because they were different. And Hanukkah, where God regained his temple just for a short amount of time to bring light and hope. But we see the Inquisition, where Jews were expelled from Spain and killed in, for their faith. And others were too, you know, convert or die. Russia had pogroms against the Jewish people. Anybody ever see um, Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, that's kind of what's happening there. Led to a lot of the early settlements of Israel and Jews in the United States, late 1800s, 1900s, because in the name of Christ, these Eastern Orthodox Christians killed, maimed, and burned down Jewish city. Now, I'm going to talk about Martin Luther on the next page to give you an idea because Martin Luther is considered a hero of the church, and I understand that. But it's an example to show us what could happen when pride enters into us. Because did Martin Luther or did God through Martin Luther do what he did? I know sometimes I get prideful. Look at that great job I did. All you have to do is be married to get rid of that pride. And everybody who laughed knew what I was saying. But we, I want to say, you know, an unlaughing thing. I want us to understand Martin Luther because I'm not going to take away from 
the epiphany God gave him and the courage to stand up to the Catholic Church. But it changed him. It made him prideful. He may have even been sick. But there were a lot of other people that were not prepared to tell Martin Luther he was wrong. Instead, they adopted his words into the culture of Germany, leading to close to 50 million worldwide deaths. Even to this day, most church people in innocence do not understand that the doctrine they're portraying in their church tells a Jewish person they're not wanted. Even though if you come into a church, I'll get to your, I will answer your question in just a second. I've never been anything but loved in every church, but I haven't felt loved by every church by their lack of interest in Hebraic roots or their um, disdain for Jewish people. Even though personally as a believer, they are so excited. I mean, it's a big deal. Oh, Jewish person. I went into a church wearing my yarmulke because I wanted to build relationships on Easter. This place had about a zillion people and I exaggerate a lot. That pastor did the whole sermon to me. Michelle was there. Then when I called him to introduce myself, oh, I already have a Messianic Jewish rabbi friend. And literally, he said that to me. And I said, you can't use two, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I've been coming to your church and people I know and I, I love you and I want to kind of meet with you. He couldn't even give me the time. I thought that was so odd. Let's go to the next page, and, and I'm going to get you after I finish this, Jim, because I wanted to finish this point about Martin Luther, because I understand that he's just it is a hero of the church. And this is why when Jewish people, you have to understand and empathize a little bit with their viewpoint when they know he is held to high esteem by most churches of what he wrote about them. He wrote a book called Full of, uh, full of lies, I think. It, full of the Jewish people's lies. It was on the other page. I apologize. I underlined that. I think it was the name of the book. It was called On the Jews and Their Lies, 1543. And he wrote in there that they were full of the devil's feces, which they wallow in like swine, and the synagogue is an incorrigible whore and an evil slut. Jewish synagogues should be burned. Jews homes demolished, writings be taken away, forbidden to preach, and all these things. Well, this is the same people that years later allowed Hitler to do these same things, and that led to them going further beyond what they thought, because in their hearts they had accepted it. I'm not going to stay into that anymore, but now I'm asking you to look at the Jewish perspective, and when you say, why don't they get it? Maybe you could see that the church hasn't always treated Jewish people with kindness and love as we see here. If I'm a Jewish person and I come in here and heard pastor praying for Israel and the Jewish people and knowing that they're going to teach the, the feast and I know that they're going to have things, then that's great because I want a church. I could join a Messianic congregation. We like it here because we want the fullness and the robustness of the nations. But we want to know that Jesus' people and the people that God loved are being taken care of. Let's look at something even more modern, and this is a terrible picture. Um, sometimes even on Holocaust Memorial things, I'm not able to do it anymore. I just, uh, then there are times when I, I do it because I'm so, I have to. And, but I believe if you ask why don't Jewish people come to Christianity, I think your answer is that the image of Christianity to many Jews are those bones. And Ezekiel said to, about bones, you know, is God done with the Jewish people? Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life direct parallel to him breathing life into Adam. And as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. 
So there is hope from God's point of view for the Jewish people. And I know this kind of takes a lot, you know, it's like advertising, you put baby pictures up there to sell something. And I'm putting pictures of dry bones. But I want, it wasn't until one became a believer and I struggled for seven years to understand Christ as God. And then I got sick on Easter and I saw five different versions of the Jesus. All of them were on. By the end of it, I learned I was a visual person seeing who Jesus was. I just loved him. The kindness that he showed to that woman who um, they were going to stone and saying, if, you know, you without sin, throw that stone. I just loved him and then understood that for the power of the world to love us so much that he wanted us to be able to relate because it's so hard to relate to an invisible, divine, distant God as the Jewish people had been portrayed thinking of him as. They would not hear the voice of God. They were afraid of God. So Jesus came as the meek and humble spirit, not weak spirit, but the meek and humble spirit so they could see God and fall in love with him and know that he loved people that he was a kind and generous person, hardworking, and that he loved them. So now let's go to the story of Adam and Eve being moved to the next slide. And we got to thank you. And kind of think about this for a minute. Do we really understand what it was like for them to be excommunicated from the garden? I don't think we do. And that's what I'm trying to help us connect. That's why I try to connect this to Israel being excommunicated from Israel. First, the temple being destroyed and then being moved out to the nations. It was their home. Have you ever lost your home? Some of us have. But think about having everything. There was rivers and fruit and vegetables and animals and it was everything. Jim, I remembered you now. So my question was, what did Luther say this to answer Do you see this thing? God blessed them and said, fill the earth and rule over it. Then he's driving man out. There were curses. The curse was on the land. Do you remember thorns? In marriage class, we talked about the childbirth, pain in childbirth. What other things? Okay, let me get your brains thinking now. What was lost? Very good. Do you kind of get the picture? They were in. You know, Manual labor. They were introduced to manual labor. They would have to now work for a living and thorns would come up. I think we all see that. It's hard to earn a living. We don't have everything just blessed. We, we have poverty. We have all sorts of evils. You see what I'm getting at? It was a bad day. When that temple was crumbled down, it was a bad day. It's sad, I know. It's like, why am I going through this? Well, we're going to be uplifted. Cain kills Abel. The first, as you think about it, you, a loss of a child. And then by the time we get to Noah, God's ready to wipe out everybody off the face of the earth. So we're, as a church, try to understand where I'm getting to that emotional connection does the church get to say the Jewish people failed and now great for us, the church? Do you see what I'm getting at? It's not the right teaching, but I understand where it's coming from, but I'm helping you to see God's point of view. The Jewish people failed no different than all of humanity failed, but through him and through Jesus, he'd bless him because Jesus came because no one could live by that law. And so when we get to Abraham, this is what's such a big deal. 
if you'll take a look over the next two weeks before we get to patriarchy, Amen, the blessings and curse. The blessings are exactly the opposite of the curses that God gave to Adam and Eve. They would have land. They would have protection. They would have no more problems with their labor. They, both men and women would be fruitful. It's exactly the opposite. So God is saying through the Jewish people and through Abraham, because of his faith, not because he obeyed the law, there was no Torah laws at that time, he's got to bless them. And he gives this thing, the blessing and curses. That would be a great word study for Sally. You are, yeah, you're the word study person. But I want everybody to do it, really. But what I'm saying is you do the Wednesday things, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but that would be a great prep to understand that because it, it, and to it start doing some of these word studies in these things because you will see that there is a hedge of protection on Israel and even Israel has been anti-Semitic to each other. When they do not accept the blessings of God and they disobeyed God, they cursed themselves in a sense. They put... They took away the opportunity to live in God's blessings, and so therefore his protection was removed, and a lot of what we see is responsible for that. But when the church curses the Jewish people, they haven't escaped. And this has caused some people to really hate me and walk out on me there, to understand that we could be blessed and still be under a curse? Do we not struggle to bring people to the Lord? Do we not have loved ones that die? Do we not see that 50% we're always having to be tempted by a world that's anti-Christian? There are 50 million people who died in World War II. Do you not, these things that happen, we're not associating them to it, but we're certainly able to associate the downfall of Israel's temples to their sin. I'm just trying to connect us. To the next slide, please. And we're only going to do about 10 more minutes. And then we're going to, you know, a little bit, and then we'll have a small service. I think I could get through some of these slides now because what I'm trying to show now is that there's a great blessing at the end of all this for the Jewish people and for you and me as believers that through the temple, God uses that example to kind of show. When we were in the garden, there were no partitions. We were with God, and he could hold our hands, and he could talk to us. But because of sin, we were expelled. When God asked him to bring the tabernacle, we're going to see his glory filled the tabernacle to show his presence. And a cloud would move from spot to spot. And when it stopped, the glory of God stopped, they would rebuild the tabernacle there. And then the camp was all around it. And it really almost looked like a cross, the way it was configured around that tabernacle. And God spoke to Moses. And there was separations and things. But, you know, and Yom Kippur, one day a year, we could go into the Holy of Holies. And then there was a first temple inside the land, and that was destroyed. Then God allowed them to rebuild it, and then Herod um, renovated it, and it became the second temple during Jesus' lifetime. After that was destroyed, you know, before that even, God calls us the born-again temple. But there's a third temple where the evil one comes, Satan and the anti-Messiah, he goes into the temple. I mean, Satan understands he break roots real well, by the way. He could go to Washington, D.C., right, and announce that he is God, but he goes to Israel and the temple. He's focused on there. He's trying to take our focus away from loving Jewish people in Israel because that moves us away from the blessings. Then Jesus comes back and institutes a fourth temple, which is what the Ezekiel bones were doing. And then God's final temple is God is the temple. But he calls it a temple. Why? Because he wants you to study the temple <laughs> and understand what it's about so you can understand what it means for God to be the temple. To think 
of living in the kind of the womb of God, it, it can't be more intimate and personal. We're going to go through this very rapidly because I'm not going to actually teach it, but I'm going to show us each stage very quickly because you can read it on the website. So the first one is that thing. There was tents and there were things outside the tent. And, it, and you see the way Israel is set up. It, it was kind of configured with all, them, all the different tribes around it. It was the center of their life where God would sit and talk to Moses. Next slide. As I said, you could read these scriptures on the website. Just like our church, and pastor's been teaching on this, right? The gifts of the Spirit. In order to build the temple, God gave them the Holy Spirit and anointed them with different gifts. And inside, one passage will do. But Exodus 35 on the bottom, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for its service in holy garments. That's the type of giving God wants rather than the tent. But because people's hearts are hard, he talked about a tithe so we would have a law and they would train them. But at this time, he stirred their hearts. He had them kind of emotionally connected to him. And he filled them with the Holy Spirit. Wow. You know, just like us today, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and build this church because it's building God's people. I think we all know that we have a pastor's teaching people and discipling them and the love we experience from each other. And that's just a little interpol for Ronnie Johns on Saturday when we bring our friends and guests to the tap. Next slide. There were different items. It's important for you to learn what those items were and what they meant. We actually have a little, we're going to see a little bit of it. We're doing good. But I have it on the next slide, but I'll just talk about it. There was an altar, the sacrifices. There was labor, the baptism, the water to cleanse. There was a door, Jesus, the narrow gate, you know, getting into the holy place. In the holy place, incense, the sweet smell. This is where um, um, Zechariah was burning incense, but in the temple part. Um, the golden lampskin, seven, light of completion. The showbread was community. We break communion now. Then in the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant, and we're going to talk about that. So let's move to the next slide. And you could see if you get on the web, and I actually have a website that teaches you on that that you'll see. But all of this was a perfect type of Christ. Now, many of you knew this and had studied a little bit, but... When we see this being destroyed, could we see it was the presence of God and the type of Christ that was destroyed? Once a year, the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. Next slide. This is very interesting. Do you remember I've been telling you everything goes back to redeeming what was lost in Genesis? This is a perfect, beautiful example. They were excommunicated in, in number seven. Now, when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him, God, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between two cherubim. Now we look back to Genesis. I, I guess let me just say it this way. As you're reading the Bible from beginning to end, ask yourself, what does this have to do with Genesis and what happened? Everything is about the kingdom. That's what Israel's about. It isn't about an ethnic people being raised up better than everybody else. It's about redeeming what we lost in the garden. So he drove man out, and the two cherubim guarded us from getting to the tree of life and eternal life with God. Now God speaking through those cherubim, opening up a little door 
of his presence. And in Ezekiel, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate facing east. Where were they guarding? The east. Jesus said to come back from the east. All temple, Jewish temples are made facing east. And the spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. See the courts, the different thing. Now he's getting back to the inner court. Behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house in the temple of Messiah. He's able to get in there. Okay, let's keep going. This is another interesting time. In Genesis, after Cain's sin, it's kind of hard to keep following this, but he's kind of excommunicated too. He becomes a wanderer. And he says, oh, this is too much to bear. I'm going to be away from the face of the ground. Thinking of it kind of that holy place, that temple place. He's still going to be on earth, but the place where he knows God. And from your face, I will be hidden. So now we have the tabernacle. Aaron becomes high priest. And now he's to bless Israel with the prayer that's called Aaronic Benediction. And it's one of the most important prayers in Judaism where God blesses Israel after each time before they go out from the temple or synagogue. And that's why you might hear Messianic congregations doing this. Now, look, listen to this wording. It's amazing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You see the connection from going from where God's face would be removed, his presence, the face of the ground, to where God is now blessing Israel again with that presence. Let's keep going. And we're going to get through. So the first temple inside the land, the only what I want to just talk about is King David wanted to build the temple. It was in his heart but he couldn't do it because of his bloodshed. But Solomon built the temple based on the preparations David made, and he prayed, saying when people, he kind of foretold Israel would be in diaspora, but he said when they pray towards this place, forgive them, your dwelling place. And God filled that place up where people couldn't even get into it, to show his presence. And then later, Daniel prays, and he tries to remain Hebraic and Jewish, and there's often issues, and if you read that, that a lot of that is about it, but he prayed facing that temple. Let's keep going. When you get on the website, you could look at Solomon's temple and see how amazing it was. All sorts of things going on there. The feasts, we're not going to go into them today, but they were to bring people there. Why? Because Jesus would do his major miracles, his death, his resurrection, and the second coming out of there. And if you look at 1 Kings, again, that was the concern of Jeroboam. Next. All we're going to talk about on this one is that Nebuchadnezzar, he knew the heart of Israel was in that temple, and to destroy that temple was kind of showing his possession of Israel and their mindset. And Jeremiah and in Kings told them exactly why it had happened because they had left the Lord their God. Basically, they cursed themselves in that Abraham's curse. <laughs> they took away the protection of God, and then people doing what they do, they went in and conquered Israel. And that's what the Lord said, because of their sin. But I think you're understanding it now. When we see the world falling apart and tragedies of our world and tragedies of past world, humanity has sinned, and even though we're being blessed with the kingdom, that's why we see so much pain and suffering in the world, and we can join with Israel in prayer tonight. Next, the second temple. 
we see Jesus, I, I already talked about this, so I'm not, Jesus' whole life focused around the temple. He loved the temple. Let's keep going. Herod's temple, the only thing I wanted to share here is that how cool this is. And maybe some of you were familiar with this in Matthew 27. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. God so into the details. You know, he could say just torn. But he wants to make sure that we know that they couldn't reach it. It had to be God himself, but really tall, right? It was huge, right? Look at all those separate areas. Women could be here. Gentiles here. You guys could get close, but you couldn't get in the inside. And then the most holy place. Isn't it amazing now that we could get into the very throne room of God when we worship, we experience that? Isn't that amazing? But you have to understand that God keeps showing sin separates. And the Jewish people, you know, they got close. Look at the court of Israel. It's a little bit closer. But thank God, that's when he's talking about the hostility being gone. Now we both could approach the throne room of God. See where that Hebrew break roots kind of helps? It's like make the two men. That's kind of what it's about. The Gentiles, they were on the outside, but they can come close. Israel could come closer. The high priest could come closest once a year. And now by taking the law and the condemnation of the law away, not the value of the temple, not the feast, not the meaning of the law in our lives, but taking away the separation that the law brought between us and God. That's really what that passage is about. That's what the hostility means. It means putting his face back in our presence. Is that interesting? I think so. You know, the one new man is that now we're both high priests when we come with the Lord. People without the Holy Spirit, they don't come into that. Like, God still loves them. He reaches them. He anoints them probably even too, temporarily like Christ. But they don't have that eternal testimony. And that's the next one. You know that your body is a temple. How much more intimate? That's pretty darn intimate. We want Jesus to come back. But you could understand God in you and know God is with you by having a relationship with the Holy Spirit and experiencing that. And so we take that power and now we go and make disciples and we go out and reach all the nations and he's redeeming back that fill the earth and subdue it. But now instead of kind of the temporary spirit of man, God in man, it's the eternal spirit of man that transverses the earth and fills it. God is not bringing the end until he redeems everything lost in the garden. I think you're seeing it now. I, I feel the connection. So we don't need to look at the next one. We already talked about Romans and everybody sin, not just Jewish people. Third temple. All the reason I want us to understand Purim and Hanukkah when the season's right is it's all about two Thessalonians. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, return of Messiah, until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawliness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming his Self to be God. I think we could see Israel's going to be important forever. We might as well get used to it. We might as well just fall in love with them. We might as well stop hating them. We might as well start getting into Hebraic roots because it's our future. Those who do it now will be blessed. There's just no doubt about it. Okay, next slide, please, sir. The Messianic temple, we've talked about Ezekiel and the bones. In the bottom one, I bring this passage up a lot, that when Jesus comes back, there's very little, you know, you know, I wish I could sell it, you know. 
here's your Millennium Kingdom program. Pick out your, you know, what you want to do on Tuesday and Thursday in the Millennium Kingdom. You know, there isn't any of that. That's one, you know, you could, anybody want to go do a study on that? I'd love to hear more about it. But that's one of the few things we know besides a big feast that we're having when the Jewish people come back is that you're going to go up and see what it says. You're going up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the completion of the feast we're trying to bring in here and do it for a thousand years in the temple in Israel, not in Rome, not in the Catholic Church, in Israel. King David's on one seat, Jesus on another, and the Lord will bring on them a plague if they don't come up. He's trying to tell the church, the nations now, stop being hesitant to go up because you want to be prepared to love Jewish people and Israel. And it's not because Jewish people are better. We're going to look at the patriarch. It's because God blessed you. It's like, honor thy mother and thy father so it will go well with you. Well, many of us have had abusive parents. Some didn't have one, then they know it. But yet God commands it. He, could, he doesn't tell you love the Jewish people. He just says those who are blessed and will be blessed. Those who are cursed and will be cursed. But he makes it really clear that he's going to bring us all together to that one new man. And it happens in Israel and it happens during a feast day. So when you say why should we do the feast, it's because God loves the feast and they represent him, not Judaism or Jewish people. They're about the unifying of the church and Israel together, because Israel and the, and the believing Gentiles make up the church. And so, by bringing us together, he's ending that hostility, and until we get it right, he's going to give us a thousand years to do it with sacrifices and all sorts of good things. Finally, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And then they, we see no temple because God is the temple. So I have a little service I'd like us to do now. It's short. And maybe just let me ask you, um, have I partially achieved my goal of connecting you to Israel, those that may not have been connected, or even if you have been? Do you see their tragedies as being humanity's tragedies, that their idol worship and sin is the same as humanity's idol worship and sin, and that through the broken body of Christ, who he calls the temple, we can come together in love. But without the Jewish people, God will not come back until they say, blessed is he. And do you know when they say that? When all nations come against them. Anti-Semitism is going to rise. And Jesus is going to wipe a lot of people out and then establish his millennium kingdom. And he's not wanting to threaten you to love Jewish people. He's just saying, can't you see what they've gone through and done on my behalf? just suffering the consequences of sin and, and losing their temple and having millions of people killed in, in the most degrading way possible to show what people are like inside. Is there, is there anything that shows sin more than you? If you haven't studied the Holocaust, please do. There's nothing that shows the inner hate that is around us and what Satan is like. And yet, because the church influences, it has driven people away from Christ rather than the love. The love is much more powerful. And when pastor gives us the chance to stand up to do these feasts, we do them in remembrance of his broken body and his people who've done it. So I'd like to ask my friend Jaime to come up. And if you could turn to the first slide of the thing, the Shema, we're going to, it's a very short service, but let's bow our heads and pray. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, thank you so much for these people. And I know I got a little preachy there, and I don't want anybody to feel personally preached at. 
I just want us to understand your compassion and love for the Jewish people because through them, you're sharing to the world what we're like, both the good things and the bad things, sometimes even the worst of things. And when we study our Bible, allow us to understand that they put themselves under a microscope so we can learn, yes, from their mistakes. But when we look at the patriarchs next week, help us understand that they've also done amazing things. All of our wonderful apostles, King David, Jonathan, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, so many people who loved you from the Jewish people and still do. And may our heart be with them as we mourn with them today for their losses of their temples and for the Holocaust and for their people. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Maruk Shem Kavod Malkuto Leolam Ba'ed Please stand and join me in English. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Yeshua Hu HaMashiach Hu Adon HaKal. Yeshua, he is the Messiah. He is Lord over all. Please be seated. <clears throat> in Mark twelve twenty nine, and in Matthew 22, God unites the Jewish understanding of Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And he explains, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And interesting enough, this is why we went for the emotional intelligence today, but we talked about your soul and mind because to love without the heart is very difficult. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these, Yeshua said, and all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So in a sense, Yeshua is saying, all the law and the prophets are valid, including the feast and the kosher laws and all of that, when we learn from them how to love God and love ourselves more than the actual practice of every one of them, it teaches us how to love. The next page is, I'd like us to read this together. This is a book from Lamentations, and this is probably one of the saddest books you could ever read. And we are going to end up on an up note, but... Please read this with me. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. She has become like a widow who was once great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a forced laborer. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. She has none to comfort her among all her lovers. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile under affliction and under harsh servitude. She dwells among the nations, but she has found no rest. All her pursuers have overtaken her in midst of distress. Mm. That prayer kind of shows the, the fear that Cain had of being a wanderer, not having their own home. And that's why having a nation in April, May 14th, 1948 was so important to the Jewish people because they had no place to go but to wander in other nations that were not treating them right. The next um, praise that we'll do, and you guys will say amen and, and, and bless me back, is what Jewish people say on morning death, and I think you could see it. it's all about exalting and praising God for life. 
May his great name grow exalted and sanctified in the world that he created as he willed. May he give reign to his kingship in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetimes of the entire family of Israel swiftly and soon. May his great name be blessed forever and ever. May his great name be blessed forever and ever. Blessed, praised, glorified, exalted, extolled, mighty, appraised and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he. Blessed is he beyond any blessing and song, praise and consolation that are uttered in the world. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life upon us and upon all Israel. He who makes peace in the heights, may he make peace upon us and upon all Israel. Blessed is he beyond any blessing and song, praise and consolation that are uttered in the world. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life upon us and upon all Israel. He who makes peace in his heights, may he make peace upon us and upon all Israel. And I think you could see that when we're doing that, when we're talking about Israel, we really are talking about all of us. We, you know, it's a, when we mourn death, we have to praise God for life because he's the keeper of life. And we do not know what happens to our loved ones during that time of transition, whether God could reach out to them. We always have to have hope. But this is why we're supposed to work so hard to save people, and it's hard. I'm not really an evangelist. I'm more of a teacher and pastor. But that's why, you know, I was telling Pastor the Ronnie Johns thing, and I'm not saying it to joke, but to reaching out to our neighbors. I have some neighbors that are on my heart to reach out to. It's hard. It was hard for me. I talked to my family right before their death, my dad's death, and they rejected me, and I got so angry, and I walked out of the dinner The next weekend, he died. Yikes. I was in pain. But I trust in God. I really do. So to conclude the service, my friend will read it down alone. Do you want to lead them in English first? Or do you want me to do that? Do Do you feel good about it? Do you want to just read it with them? I would rather you do it if you're up to it. And then I'll conclude. Probably one verse. I learned a lot today. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, it, the closeness that the Christians and Jews, that uh, together we become as one, and uh, the Messiah will, will uh, come and bless all of us. The, the, the Odan Olam um, if, is basically, I was trained in, the, in a very, very traditional synagogue. And when I was there, people were wondering, why is this South American boy from the jungles of Amazon doing here? And I don't know. I was just there. <laughs> but one rabbi came up to me and said that in 1945, six million Jews died. Then there was so many souls that went up to heaven that the Lord had to recycle them. I was, I was born in 63, so I think I got one of those recycled souls because... I've had Israel in my heart ever since I could remember. So when I was going through Hebrew school, I remember the first day I was there, they were teaching me classes, and I had my books and everything, and I was ready. The problem was I didn't speak Hebrew. So does anybody here remember a program back in the 70s called Mr. Ed? It was about a horse. Uh, It was a sitcom about a horse that could talk. So I just pulled the Mr. Ed. (laughs) You know, uh, they used to put peanut butter in the horse's mouth, and he would go, mm. mm-hmm. So that's what, that's what I would do, because I, I, I didn't read Hebrew, and I didn't understand it then. So I just 
move, I figured if I moved my lips, everybody <laughs> was too busy. They didn't see what was going on. So finally, when it started clicking in, I realized I probably did look like a horse eating peanut butter. But O'Donnell Alam is, after the services, is the, the last prayer saying that, uh, yes, um, the service has come to a conclusion. So the translation is in English. I had brought my, my Hebrew translation book, but I... Um, Could you see the one? Pardon? Whichever one you feel most comfortable. Well, they can see that one. It says, okay. Master of the world, who was king before any form was created, at the time when he made all wrought, uh, all through his will, then his name was called king. After all is gone, he, the awesome one, will reign alone. He, and he was, and he is, and he will be in splendor. And he is one, and there is no second to compare to him or be his equal, without beginning, without end, and to him is the power and rulership, rulership. He and he is my God and my living redeemer and the rock of my faith in times of distress. He is my banner and he is a refuge for me. My portion on the day I cry out in his hand, uh, in his hand I entrust my spirit when I sleep and when I wake and my soul shall remain with my body. Hashem is with me, and I am not afraid. Amen. That's, that's the, the, um, that is the translation. Now I'm going to sing it to you, and I really don't need this. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to hold it for you? No, no, thank oh, you. You just really no, do it. Okay, you'll boost. Okay. I got to talk about miracles of God here. To me, Jaime's a miracle. Uh, two weeks, literally two weeks before he came to church, I was meeting with um, Pastor Randall, who's becoming a rabbi. You remember him from Passover, bearded God, what? And he's starting a fellowship, and I told him, what we need, every rabbi needs a cantor, because I can't carry a tune. And we prayed that, he would bring somebody to us and to come here so we could, when we do some services, I'm hoping we'll do some of the feast. We're going to get him prepped and to have someone who could do it. I thought that was pretty good. Did you guys think it was? Um, I, I, he's come over for dinner. We already talked. It's, I believe it's an answer to a prayer. And, I, and it's what really I've been talking about. Pastor... Joni came here and talked about this being a gate church. 
I believe that. Do you guys believe that? I, 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 I think this place is going to explode. And we're going to need more room and um, because there isn't a place that's really uniting the Jew and the non-Jew really in a church-orientated way. Messianic congregation have a lot of Gentiles, by the way, most 70%. But I'm more, I spent my first 12 years more in the church environment. This is where I'm more comfortable, but I got to have those Hebraic roots. And we want to bring more and more people. There are more and more people, both Jew and non-Jew, wanting a place like this. And I believe, but the prophetic that they're going to teach, we got to be in the prophetic. It isn't only about Hebraic roots. It's about integrating it inappropriately. You see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to turn this into a Messianic congregation or get a dozen Jews. But a foundation has to be what, you know, I brought something as an illustration after I thought Greta did such a good job of that. Okay. This is the New Testament, and this is the Old Testament. If you think of the Old Testament as outdated, here's what Israel did wrong, now here's what the church will do right, we're wasting a lot of great scripture. And thank you, Pastor, for giving it. If we look at this as what God intended for us to do right, regardless of who we are, and then Jesus said, okay, you can't do it, so I'll die for you, and now go out and show other people that they could understand the law and study the law and study God because they could face him. They won't have to hide like Adam and Eve did for fear and shame, but they can come close to the presence of God. So next time we meet, we will do the people of Israel. We did the temple, we did the people, and then the final one, we're going to do Israel, the land, and the nation. Okay? Thank you all. Five minutes left. Okay, did you enjoy it? Good. Next week, um, Rabbi, did, you didn't go over the, the wedding. Is that going to be anywhere else? Because if not, I can do it next week. Okay, next week we're going to look at the Jewish wedding and the gospel. Okay, in fact, it was a whole section we never got to that I added to the um, marriage without regrets, but we just, I didn't do it. So what we'll do is next week we'll look at that, which will lead into the patriarchs and the people, okay? Sound good? All righty. Father, thank you for tonight, and thank you for what you did. In Jesus' name, amen. See you all Sunday morning.